Welcome to Healing Voices Project, where we share stories of addiction, grief, recovery, and courage. And also from people who work every day in the field of substance abuse who discuss their experiences and advice. I'm Mike Torville, your host. Thank you all for joining us. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. If it's your first time listening to us, uh, we're Healing Voices Project, and you can visit us at healingvoicesproject.com to learn more about our podcast and, and other things we have going on. And this is um, um, our second episode in 2022, season two, episode two, and in the theme of two, today we have two guests. Uh, <laughs> two good friends, uh, Cecilia Calabrese, um, better known, more affectionately known as CC Calabrese, who is a long-term Agawam resident, um, involved with the community as a vice president of the city council yes. for 17 plus years. You lost track. I'm, uh, I, I, uh, I'm starting uh, my ninth term. Oh, wow. This yeah. is my, technically my fourth term as council vice president. Wow. Yes. So you've seen some changes, yeah. A little bit, yes. <laughs> and uh, our other guest is Jason Campbell, uh, who is not known as JC. However, <laughs> <laughs> however, um, he is the president um, of JC Films, and among other things. And you are actually a newly elected city councilman in Bridgeport, West Virginia. So thanks for coming, both of you. Uh, and you know, one of the things I'll, I'll mention here before we get started is because, and, and why, why are we having Jason and Cece here? Is that, you know, we, we have, we, we share stories of addiction, we share stories of people who have gone through substance abuse and their families. And, but more than that, I think we want to share perspectives. We want to share voices of people who, who deal with this, who struggle through this. It could be family members, it could be parents, public officials. Uh, police officers, law enforcement, counselors, and people who share their perspectives to help us gain a different point of view and what we can learn from. And so this is why we have Cece and Jason on today, because even our two towns, Bridgeport and Agawam, um, and I've been to both, and Jason's been up here in Agawam many times, a lot of similarities in the challenges that we face. And um, you know, what can we share? How can we collaborate to sort of join forces and learn from each other? Uh, and with that, I think it's good for us to share information. And I know Cece and I, we've been talking about some of the things we have happening in Agawam. And, and Jason, you certainly um, are just getting started <laughs> in Bridgeport. Right. But, and I know one of the things that um, <clears throat> you decided to run is, is to start, is just find a way to make a difference in your town. Um, right. So, uh, so I, I've given just a quick thing, but I'll... Uh, turn the, the mic over to each of you. First, I'll go with Cece. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and sure. then we'll get to Jason and then start into uh, how we can work together. Sure. Uh, well, just like Jason, I first ran for city council to see how I can improve things in my town. My particular issue at that point in time were sidewalks, especially the sidewalks around the schools. We've progressed past that. Our infrastructure is, is doing well. Our sidewalks are doing well. And then I had uh, a dear friend of mine lose a son to suicide, and uh, it, it was later found that, that he was a uh, kind of hiding his heroin addiction, trying to work it out in, himself, and we surmised that uh, this was his only avenue that he could see his uh, way through. Is he a teenager? Or yes. A, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that kind of, you know, while I always feel blessed, that we haven't had that issue touch our family, it, it really broke my heart. And I see so many families that are suffering through this addiction. And when um, uh, Jason came up uh, and got involved with the Jack Jonah Project, I thought, gee, maybe this is a way that I can contribute to help raise awareness of this issue. Long story short. That was two years ago. It now, was right? two years <laughs> ago. I know, I know. It was two years ago. And I, I have, over the years, forged some really wonderful relationships with my fellow elected officials, the mayor in our town, and our school committee. And 
So I reached out to them to see what they're doing, and uh, they were letting me know about the, uh, the district-wide support team that meets monthly uh, to, to help uh, families and, and that are struggling with drug addiction. And there's, there's other projects, uh, other things going on in town as well. I don't want to monopolize too much of the opening <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. time. Uh, yeah. so, so I'll throw it back over to Jason, and I'll come back to, to some of the other things that I have to contribute. Awesome. Well, like Cece said, I, I visited up there several times, but th I guess the big time I was there, we were there two weeks filming the uh, Jack Jonah film, and just lovely people up there, and uh, what people have done up there you know, Kirk Jonah, of course, with the foundation of taking uh, this story of his son and kind of making it a worldwide story through the film. Uh, I think there's a sweet spot or a sweet area for this whole thing for us to kind of be involved in, especially with opioid awareness. It has affected all of us in some way. Uh, me running for city council, um, you know, the opioid crisis in West Virginia is huge. It's, it's a big issue. It's something that makes the front page of our newspaper every day from the various cities and towns of, of West Virginia. Now it hasn't really affected here in Bridgeport. We haven't seen, you know, a massive, but every once in a while, there's a story that comes out that says someone's been arrested in the town. Um, so it's not a matter of if it happens, it's when it's gonna happen. And so we, as a city here, I know we're prepared for that. We really support law enforcement in different avenues to our schools to educate young people on the issue. But I think there was that whole thing that launched from this was kind of the, uh, that film, you know, the the simple story that Kirk wanted to tell about his son, uh, I think that really kind of engineered and pioneered a lot of things. And like you said, Mike, that was what two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of cool that you know that all started two years ago. And here, you've got this website and this you know wonderful organization here of people sharing their stories, because that's as a filmmaker. That's what it is. It's all sharing stories. I mean, stories are key, and um, people share stories, and people get affected. You know, yeah. uh, not to change subject, but your book, A Promised Astrid. I mean, one of our most successful films out there because it just tells a wonderful story. So, um, stories are so important. Yep, and I agree. And thanks for mentioning that because you know the topics couldn't be more different. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, one thing evolves into the next, and a promise to Astrid <clears throat> led to our friendship, and and then doing the Jack Jonah movie, which then spawned the book Voices from the Fallen, which then led to this podcast. So each thing just keeps going. But even before that, Jason, I know when you and I first discussed the making or the possibility of making a movie about um, heroin addiction. I know, and you can talk a little bit about what JC Films is doing, but I know that you've made a lot of very family-oriented, faith-based movies, purposeful movies. For example, you address high school bullying, internet safety, yeah. and, and, you know, with these <clears throat> types of topics that you've done even before we met. Um, but I think this just led to the more serious topic of, of heroin addiction. But if you want to mention a little bit about JC Films and what that's about, that would be helpful. So just real briefly, I started this thing with Eric Estrada of all people. So uh, we wanted to make a film that would educate moms and dads and grandparents on internet safety. And so we did, made a, we made a film called Finding Faith and then we toured the film. And next thing you know, it wasn't just internet safety, it was uh, school prayer, it was uh, homelessness, it was bullying. Um, so basically we're a film company that goes out there and tries to tackle social issues, things that are really affecting people and also make films that make people think, you know, with Astrid, it was basically the story of kindness. How can one person with so much kindness affect an entire community? So all of our films kind of have that underlining tone, uh, tackling an issue. What's this issue? What as a family can we watch and kind of discuss? Um, and that, you know, of course we tackled the uh, opioid issue there in Western Massachusetts with uh, Jack Jonah. Um, that's kind of what we've been doing. I think it's uh, 50 films later, here we are. So. Yeah, and speaking of that, because I know, in fact, our the, the, the next guest following this, so it'll air in a few weeks, is Keith Nodick, yeah. who is featured in your one of your upcoming movies called One Cop's Journey, which addresses alcoholism. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, this was a decorated officer in California that basically had uh, life in front of him and just got too consumed with alcohol and um ended up after he retired getting a dui so you have this decorated police officer getting a dui but it was that dui that kind of 
uh, you know, changed his life and pointed him in the right direction. Wonderful man. You'll enjoy him. He's mm-hmm. a good guy. Yeah, yeah. He's been great. We've been talking a little bit. Uh, now, <clears throat> with that, and again, that's how we all connected. And I know you'll be coming up here again in March. Right. Uh, <clears throat> maybe we'll visit you down to get away from this cold, too. But that's another story. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the th- you just joined. I mean, think your election to the city council was back in November. You've been on for, you know, three, four months now. What have you seen and what what inspired you to run for city council? Well, one of the things is the opioid thing is a big deal in West Virginia because so many of our small towns are affected by it. And Bridgeport mm-hmm. is a very small town. Uh, 9,000, 10,000 population. Um, and it's like you said, Mike, it's identical to Agawam. I think we name our churches the exact same names your churches are named. So every corner has the same thing. You know, was, we shot a, a, a promised asteroid in Bridgeport, but you couldn't tell it wasn't Agawam, just the yeah. way the cottage homes were set up and the lawns and everything. So you couldn't tell the difference. Mm-hmm. But um, so it's very similar. And I know that a couple months ago, Cece and I were on a telephone call about uh, you know, what she has done with city council, what I'd like to do here in Bridgeport, because it has, like I said, it hasn't really come here yet, but it's starting to. And all we need is one high school student to overdose. Um, it will, it will wreck this little community. It will, um, it's a, it's a tight knit community, small population. Um, but if it can happen in little smaller towns, it, it can happen it can happen here. So we're just trying to get ready for that. And I really appreciate CC taking some phone calls from me to try to get me kind of understanding what their city is doing, what Agawam is doing and being effective. Sorry about my cat. Oh, she's beautiful. (laughs) I'm a cat person, so. (laughs) Uh, Well, CC, I know, and we talked, you have a few programs that might be worth sharing and talking about some of those programs. And and again, I think besides this little, conversation here we'll be talking along the way to share w- what each of our towns are doing and right but you have uh, a few programs that we do yeah. uh, one of the uh, the real highlights uh, in our school system is what we affectionately call Rosie robotics and that is a uh, an international robotics competition that uh, it's the, the parent company's first robotics and it's uh, it, it's ongoing right now. In fact, right now they're in what's called build season. And the way the program works is there's an international kickoff. They pick a day, a time, and teams from literally around the world go online and the organization uh, reveals the game, the object. And now all the students with mentors, but the students do all the building, they, they design the robot, they build the robot, they run the robot. The beautiful thing about this program is you don't have to be an engineering person. I, I, I mean, I know that there's, there's a big push for uh, what, they, what we now call STEAM, not just STEM, with the science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. So if you are an art student or you like to draw, you might be the perfect person to actually sketch out what this robot's gonna look like. If you have a knack for taking that drawing and then making those elements. If you like to machine, for example, there's, there's a lot of machining, there's programming, there's team building. And my point of this being, you need to reach out and get these kids that feel like they don't have any place else to belong. And mm-hmm. Rosie Robotics is one such program. I always say it saved my son's life. My son has a, learning ba- a language-based learning disability. In the seventh grade, he, a wonderful man named John Burns, who I, I swear he was put on this earth to save children, kind of tapped my son and mm. his little group of kids and said, hey, come on, we're going to go build robots. And it's just an amazing program. And, uh, and that, that I think really a lot of kind of kids that might have slipped through the cracks found a home in, in the robotics program. See, that sounds great. And unlike some of the other programs, let's call it a language club where it's m- more single dimension you know it's one thing but this looks like it covers many things with whether yes. it's a science engineering art and it, you could group together people with different talents exactly yeah. it, there's also a marketing component mm-hmm. because part of this is to go out and get fundraising so uh, the, the, the students have to come up with a marketing plan to present okay this is what we're gonna do 
we need some more funds to build this thing because let's be honest, you know, money's tight. And so they get corporate sponsorships. It's, it's, it's really an impressive, mm. impressive program. So, you know, if you don't like the actual building, but hey, you want to get some marketing experience, you join the, the robotics team. You see, and that's great because I think with the, what happens when kids get drawn into substance abuse, whether it's drinking or, or drugs, sometimes it's just their isolation, their lack of uh, resources, activities, clubs, right. when they just feel alone, right? isolated, depressed, and so on. Giving them an activity gives them some, for lack of a better word, I don't say distraction, but something to occupy their time. Exactly, right? a sense of belonging, yep. a sense of, hey, you know, yep. I, th there is something constructive that I can do with my life. And a lot of the kids that have come through Agawam, my goodness, uh, a few years ago we had a kid, our valedictorian was on the robotics team. He got a full boat ride to, um, uh, you know, out in Cambridge there. Oh, <laughs> you know, you know that technical <laughs> school out there in Boston. Boston has a college out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the kids at WPI call it, you know, affectionately call it, you know, the, the, the Boston Technical College. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, I think that's, and programs like that, I think, because, you know, when we say, okay, what, what leads the, the high school kids to the direction of, of taking drugs? What, what, what can we fix and how can we prevent that? The, obviously, the best cure is prevention, right? right? So the earlier you can nip that. And these are the types of programs. What other things in Aguam do we have happening that you think has been helpful to, to share? Oh, my goodness. Well, I talked about the, uh, you know, the district-wide support team. Um, goodness, we ha we're, we're coming up with a, uh, we're starting a new program along with Jason uh, for people that might be interested in filmmaking or performing or, um, you know, production. And so that's in the very early works that uh, we're going to be hopefully drawing in people Specifically, kids, you know, to to to. I think into I think what Cece's saying. I love what she's saying about getting young people involved. I, I kind of that's kind of our one of our heartbeats here is the fact that I remember speaking at a school one time. The the school asked me to come speak, and I spoke in front of all these seniors, and I was talking about filmmaking and all these kind of things. And uh, I asked the group. I said, "How many of you guys are interested in filmmaking or being in films?" And like one or two, good about a hundred kids in there, but one or two kids raised their hands. Um, because they were kind of embarrassing when I say anything. Because after the program, they all like came into me and said, "We really, we want to be involved in films, and I've got a camera, and I've got this, and I've got a YouTube channel, and I want to do this." So we had this idea with filmmaking that kids are interested in it, um, and it's something that kids can do. I mean, you give some of these kids with camera. You, Mike, you and I've talked about this. Some of these kids with cameras are so more talented than we'll ever be with <laughs> filmmaking and, and uh, just t tremendous talent. And so if we can take that talent and young people and get them engaged in filmmaking, storytelling. It's just another way that we can get them into other programs like the robotics program. That's that's a big thing here, CC oh, and good. Bridgeport with the schools. And so these programs that are getting kids into other programs, one thing you said, Mike, kids that slip through the cracks, these are kids that aren't into sports. These are kids that uh, aren't into the cheer or into dance. But you know, these are the kids that kind of fall through the cracks. And we learned this with um, with Jack. I mean, Jack was a very artistic kid. Uh, I mean, going back after he passed away, his diaries, his paintings, these things still linger in our thoughts because he was so artistic. And think about some, if we can take some of these kids that are artistic and put them into film or art or different things they want to express themselves with, I think it's a benefit. And as you and I have talked about many times, if we could just save one kid's life, we don't need to know about it. We don't need, we don't need any applause from it. But if we can have programs, things like this, uh, where people are sharing, where people are telling their stories, where it's affecting people, and we can change one, um, then it's well worth all the effort, all of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, another thing <clears throat> that I think contributes to, to the problem is, as we all know, is the single parent households, right? You have a child without a father, without the influence. And how do you... <clears throat> How do you make up for that? Well, sometimes you have a group, uh, whether it's the robotics program, where there may be people who provide that influence in the absence of a, of a father or mother in a single parent household. Because sometimes, you know, if you don't get that, you could certainly make a strong correlation between drug use and single parent households. But providing these clubs, these activities, oftentimes, whether it's a coach, 
or teacher. Yeah. Somebody right. actually can step up and provide that, that go-to person, that influence, that trusted parent that a child can relate to. I think yeah. that's, that's impo- an important aspect to, to not leave kids sort of lingering by themselves, feeling like they're left out, um, abandoned, or just without a, a certain parent, a mom or a dad, um, handicaps them. You know, it's funny because it's it's so different now. I re- I remember I'm not giving away my age, but I mean, I would walk home from school. I'd be home till five, six o'clock. Mom would come in and make dinner. But we, we figured out things to do for four or five hours and played outside and rode our bikes. Do you remember those days? <laughs> uh, it's not I don't think we can, you know, leaving kids alone um, with their tech, with their devices or different. I just, it's, it's not like that anymore. It's, it's kind of, it's not built like that anymore. Um, it has put a lot of pressure on parents and, and schools because we've got to keep providing activities and things to get our kids involved in so that we can, you know, keep them in the right path. But, you know, at the same time between schools and churches, I think, you know, we're going down the right path. And I, I think as long as we've got people that are out there willing to serve, to be a part of the solution, um, and sometimes it may be wrong, but at least they're being a part of the solution. Um, and I think that's what's good about these these podcasts you're doing and, and everything that you know that you're doing is just trying to get people out there. Because if we have more people serving, then we're we're going to be able to eliminate the problem. Yeah, I think having parents volunteer for some of these programs. Oh my goodness! <laughs> you know, my my son uh, kind of came full circle and actually coached uh, a Lego oh. team a couple of years ago with yeah. a parent. Um, it was with a mom and she had, she was doing it because her son was on the team and she wanted to be involved. Yeah. And it was such an amazing experience for the two of them because my son for the first time got a chance to mentor other kids that were coming through what he had just come through mm-hmm. with, with, a, with a mom who he didn't know before. And, and to see the dynamic between the two of them work so well, you know, now he's, he's launching his own uh, computer repair business. Wow. Yeah, hmm. yeah. So um, it's it, it can work. It can work. And if you're watching this podcast right now and you're thinking, well, gee, you know, maybe I have some crazy idea. It may not be so crazy. You you may have the idea that will reach that one at-risk child that, you know, Jason was just saying, if we could save one life, we don't need to know about it. We just need to do it. Yeah. 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 Don't be afraid to step up. Certainly when you when you don't do anything, you, you can guarantee you won't have that impact. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so That's right. by doing something, even if you never know about it. Right. Um, and I, I know it's hard, too, because we talked about social media, um, and, you know, there's certainly some positive effects of that. But, you know, when you don't have these activities and it, a, a teenager or a high school student goes home and they just bury themselves, in their phone and their social media, and uh, hours and hours later they come out, and again you, you get some some sort of twisted perception of what the reality of things because everything is um, measured through you know, your worth, <laughs> um, peer pressure, and so on right. through social media. So pulling away from that little device is <laughs> is helpful, and so the programs you talked about yeah. I think do that to some help. Right, right, but, yeah. right. They do, you know, yeah. because you have to be hands on if, mm-hmm. if you're. In, in, in build mode for the robot, for example, I know I keep coming back to Rosie, but it's such a great example. You, you can't be sitting there playing on your on your iPhone or your iPad or your, or your computer games. No, you've got to be in there working and building and contributing to the team. And the successes that come out of that, when, when that robot first, you fire it up and you see it move and, and it does the, te- whether it's putting a ball through a basketball hoop, you know, or, or, or climbing. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, a, a poll that, that sometimes they have to do. There's a great deal of satisfaction of having worked as a team and seeing that success. Yep. And, you know, I think uh, this, uh, talk about the obvious, this whole COVID effect, right? The kids were home and learning from home. And, okay, certainly that was just awful and it's oh. still not over yet, as we all know. But if there's one if there's one little silver lining in this is it made parents a little bit more aware yeah. uh, of, of what's happening. And so you, now you see some parents stepping up and say, hey, wait a minute, what kind of a program is this? What kind of a class is this? What are you teaching right. my kids? Right. And so now you see that that kind of collective uh, awareness and involvement from parents that are just saying, hey, n- now that we see more, 
We need to get mm. involved. Exactly. And I think that sparked a, a lot more participation in the school programs, the education, and all that. So if there's one positive thing that we can glean from that, maybe it's forced that attention. Do you think? I think that's a, I think yeah. that's a great perspective. Yeah. I think for the first time, parents are, are are at home with their kids, and they're kind of maybe not intentionally looking over their shoulders, but looking over their shoulders, and, and they're seeing what's being taught, and they may be like, hey, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> what is this doing in a math class, you yeah, know, yeah. Or, or a history class, and, and, and you know, why, you know, and, and so parents are now stepping up and being more vocal because maybe they see things that are going on that they didn't realize were going on. They didn't see before. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so now, it, and again, it could have to do with classes, activities, the extracurricular things yes. that they're saying, hey, wait a minute, who, who's the coach? Who's the right. parent that's leading this, this club? Right. Maybe they'll volunteer now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? uh, so we hope that that grows from this, if there's one thing, you know. You see that in, um, in Bridgeport, Jason? I do, and I think it's a pretty cool perspective. I, I never really thought about that before, but we have seen that. We've seen more parents get involved, um, but I think it does. I, I think I think COVID kind of slowed the family down a little bit, you know, made everyone kind of stop and be home, and um, we were kind of forced to, to talk with one another, and so I think it's a pretty good perspective. You know, I, as, you know nationally, of course, we're, we're seeing more and more moms and dads go to school board meetings, and, you know, like it or not, but it's, they're still getting involved. Um, so I think it's a pretty cool perspective. I think it's a good opportunity for us to kind of jumpstart uh, an involvement in our kids' lives. Yeah, and if some parents now feel a little bit more enlightened to say, hey, wait, <laughs> maybe <laughs> this has got to motivate me to get more involved. Right. And uh, hopefully that it, it changes something, you know. And you yeah. know, speaking of schools, and one of the things, and, you know, I have three, four grandchildren, um, 16, 14, 12, and 2, uh, but obviously I'm concerned uh, about the access of drugs, the impact of social media, peer pressure, all those things. And Jason, sir, you, you got a, an expanded family. Yeah, we do. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, you and Heather, six, how many at home? Many? It, well, together yeah. uh, we have 10. So if you add them all up from all sides, that's a blended family, but if mm -hmm. they're all part of our family, we, right now we're claiming 10. Okay, you got two <laughs> basketball teams. Okay, you got two right. basketball. <laughs> and Cece, of course, you're a parent. And, I am. Yeah. I am. Both, both my children are grown. Yeah. Um, yeah. My my daughter is actually a, a filmmaker in New York City, and she she was involved with uh, with the Jack Jonah film yeah, when she was still a student. Um, She's very talented. She is. Yeah. She is. Yeah. yeah. Her her first film is doing really well, and her yeah. second film won is awards editing. too, right? I'm sorry. It won some it awards. It did. Yeah. She's got ten laurels right now. She, oh. yeah, yeah, she's doing really well. She, 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 she works in a different genre mm -hmm. than Jason does. Yeah. Um, but she's got that amazing skill set and work ethic that is that it was kind of yeah. nice for her to see Jason in action, because at the time she didn't understand certain aspects of filmmaking that now she does. Yeah. You know, so. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. She really, you know, I remember when she was coming through. The, the process of filming and she was like geez I wonder you know why he does that why he says that and she's like I get it now you know mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and so she's she's got her second film in editing and her third film the script is written she's got her cast she just needs to raise the money oh yeah to, to shoot the film so <laughs> that's the hard part <laughs> it is it is uh, and like I say my yeah. son um, he's he's grown so both my kids are adults he's starting his own business and um, and yeah. uh, mix 24. She's 24. She's going to be 25 in April. My son is uh, 26. Mm -hmm. Yes. So oh. think about what's changed since your kids were in high school and right. the 12 to 18 year olds, and and what's changed so in the much. years since. So much has changed. So much. Very quickly. Yes. And what those changes are what Jason's facing now exactly. because your son. Yeah. Um, how old are the boys now? So Carson, uh, five and six. So they're just yeah. Oh man, <laughs> I don't envy you, Jason. I always said, "Thank goodness my kids." Are <laughs> yeah, but think about it. And I'm a little nervous. I don't know how you feel, but you think about what the kids are faced with in school and the access and just the influence of of different kids that coming in. I, I, it, I, I don't know. It just. Uh, you know, I, I read this. I read this yeah. thing the other day, and I, I had an opportunity to visit Amsterdam. And yeah, everyone's heard of Anne Frank and the Anne Frank Diaries and. Um, 
several years ago, I went to Anne Frank's house and saw this where the, the where they were, you know, where they were hidden and where they were put in this back closet. And for two and a half or three years, I think it was that they were hidden in there. You know, um, Anne was with her family, so she was with her dad all of this time. And of course, later after they were found, Anne was killed. The father lived though, and um, they interviewed him later after her diaries became very famous and said did you know that she was writing these diaries and he said no and then but he read them and this is one of the things he said he said i didn't know her after reading his daughter's diary he was like i didn't know my own daughter and it wasn't you know a, a bad thing to say that because she had written a lot of personal things and different things about it but here's a man that stayed in this room with this girl for two and a half years no bigger than a closet and for him to say i really didn't know who my daughter was from what she was writing really got me in a perspective of thinking, you know, we don't really know our kids. And uh, of course, you know, you look at all the situations that are going on with, I would bet you say 80, 90 to 100% of the parents that say my kid overdosed on heroin, they say, I just didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know this was going on. I didn't know this was a problem. Um, so that's, you know, that's in a perspective that I look at and just going as much as I love my kids is sometimes we don't really connect with them or really know them as well as we should. Um, and I think one of the things that Kirk brought out in the film, and I remember him telling Dean this on set and Dean did this in the scene was where to go look for things. Remember that? Remember he, he was in your house, Mike, and, and yeah. you know, the backpack and yep. hidden different things and drawers in different ways uh, so that moms and dads can really be involved in their kids' life, not spying on them, but I, I think we're at a situation in our culture right now where we do have to do a little bit of spying to see what our kids are into, because um, heaven forbid it's too late. Right, and you know the spying, certainly your child would be ticked off at you for a little bit, for sure. They won't be happy about it, but that's temporary. Yeah. You know, and I think, like I said, if it's too late, and well, it's Jack Jonah's case, and Jack, yeah. uh, Kirk and Debbie had no idea he was using um, to the point it was too late. And he hadn't, didn't think he had a reason to, to check his room, to check his backpack. He just didn't think he had a reason. Because he, like you said earlier, it, he knew Jack, but he didn't know. There was a lot that he didn't know. Right. Yeah. And that's very common. I think that's a great point because I think making more of an effort to know your kids and to, and to probe a little bit, um, it, you're the parent. You're, you're not the friend. And, you know, yeah, you're going to piss your kid off a little bit. Um, it's uncomfortable. I don't like it either, but I would rather that. I'd rather find something, try to intervene somehow. So easy to say, isn't it? Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, and sometimes <laughs> cliches are true, you know, but yeah. being a parent is, the, is, is, the, is a tough job, and, and I, you know, and I, and I love it. And um, I don't think you ever stop parenting your kids, you know, even though mine are adults now and, and kind of making their own way through life. Uh, there's mm. there's never going to come a time where I feel like I can't step up as a parent. No, <clears throat> my mom is 82. She lives down the street from me, a mile away, oh. and uh, talk often, which I'm grateful for. Sure. Uh, and my son, my older son's 40, will be 41 in March, and uh, I still think about him as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. Yeah. So I'm thinking my mom probably still thinks of me as a kid too, <laughs> and that's just the way it is, and that's fine. Right. Um, but but you're right. You you just don't stop. No, um, no, you don't. It is it is what it is. So I think even getting to know your child and and you know you you have it's natural because gosh, when I was 16, I was keeping things from my parents. It wasn't their business. I mean, of course, we didn't have access to drugs. It wasn't. It was different. But still, um, the going out and drinking a few beers with your buddies um, wasn't. I, I that extension it. telephone in your bedroom. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. Okay, yeah. So get off the phone because it was the right? only one in the house. Exactly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it was certainly a, a simpler time. But I still didn't. I wasn't transparent with my parents. But what kid is? But you still, I think, you have to make an effort to watch, observe, and it's again easy to say. But but dive in a little bit. Um, like with Kirk's example, look in the backpack, look in the room, look through the drawers. And, you know, you could talk about denial. No, none of my kid's fine. My kid's fine. Mm. And maybe it's a little bit of denial. You don't want to know the truth. It's hard, but you certainly don't want to end up in the point where it's too late either. So again. You need to be the parent, not the friend. Yeah. You really do. They'll yeah. have plenty of friends. They'll only have one set of parents. And those friends, again, I, I'm grateful because I've got friends I've had since I was 13 were still good friends and believe me I'm, I'm, I love it but 
honestly, in the, for the most part, those friends change. They yes. come and go. Your parents are permanent. Exactly. You're going to have your parents like, hey, you know, I'm yeah. 63 and I'm, I still have my mom and I'm glad she's a mile away. So uh, that's always there. Right. <laughs> and, right. You know, and I, I it, it, you could get it through the kids' their parents' head that this is this is um, far more important than than your friends. But again, and, and I don't want to get too political on this, but I've been I'm fascinated with that whole Crumley case going on in Michigan, and I've been watching that. Of course, I'm um, reading up about that, but you know. I think those parents were completely ignored their kid. I don't think they were involved at all. I mean, you know, of course, there's still a trial. And let's get both sides of the story. But from what I'm reading, it's like that may be a huge wake up call for moms and dads, because this is the first time really, um, you know, criminally prosecuting parents for being bad parents because of what this child did and, and the actions that he did and killing those uh, killing kids. So I, I'm following that because I think it's a wake up call for moms and dads. And I, every time I watch one of these court cases, I think the, I look at the mom and the dad up there, Mr. And Ms. Cromley, and they just look shocked. Like, why am I here? And, you know, why am I being prosecuted criminally and looking at the rest of my days in prison because I was a bad parent? And I, I think, you know, we get more moms and dads watching that and being held responsible for some of the actions their children are doing. Um, not to get on a tangent, but it, it's a fascinating case. The first time ever we're holding moms and dads accountable for being bad parents. Uh, yeah, um, I've got to follow that. I did. What uh, do you know? Much I, about, I, uh, I I only tangentially, not not uh, not as in depth as Jason. Oh, okay. But <laughs> one of the things that I always say, and, and it's it's kind of funny. I'm of the age where every so often people ask me for advice. Young people getting married, and what I always say to them is before you have kids, make sure you really want them. Mm. You gotta <laughs> want those, you make sure you really want them before you have them because they're with you for the rest of your life. And it's not just until they're 18. Right. They're with you for the rest. Yeah. So, so if, you, if you're not ready to step up and be a parent, do society a favor. Maybe being a parent is not for you, okay? But you've, you've got to really want them, you've got to love them, and, and you've got to be their parent, not their friend. Yeah. And you know, one of the, this is a little thing, but my, my 16 year old granddaughter, Lily, she'll be 17 in March. She's learning to drive. So I volunteered to <coughs> teach her to drive. Whew. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> because her mom and dad, my son, would say, oh, no way. <laughs> now, they, they also have three other younger children to, to take care of. But what I, why I bring this up is the time with Lily in the car is just us. And I've gotten to know her well yeah. by just that driving, just putting the time into driving. I said, I've gotten way more out of this than just the driving lessons. I've gotten to hear her confide in me about things, learning things. I said, wow, that's wonderful. And even just doing something like that, parents putting time, let's do a project. Let's learn to drive. Let me teach you how to do this. That gives, it relaxes a child too, it disarms them in a way. And then you, you learn more. And I thought, what a wonderful thing, unexpectedly, that I've got to, to know her better just through driving you got to have safe spaces for your kids to talk to you yeah and and yeah. it's interesting you say that because whenever when my kids were younger and and we would be in the car and i'd be driving them somewhere i'd turn the radio off and i always say okay this is our safe space <laughs> this is our cone of silence have at it what do you want to know i you know it, yeah. you, you know and and it was amazing what my kids would open up to me about it's yeah right and yeah. you just find a way to relax disarm them and right. finally say wow well. right now I know when Lily hears this podcast, she's going to clam up, and I'm <laughs> to say that's it. <laughs> that's okay. Um, well, I know we're we're getting close on the time, uh, and before we go, there's a couple things I just mentioned. I, I think you know we could. I'd love to do an update in in a couple months. I would what, love that. What's happening with Bridgeport and Agawam and other programs and things that are working and um, other changes. So why don't we? Plan to do that in a in a couple months again. Do the uh, yeah. CC Sounds and great. JC update. How's that? I like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we'll uh, we'll plan for that. But anything before we um, conclude this episode? Anything else you want to, that we didn't get to talk about that you think that? Um, I think we actually covered it pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything from your end, Jason? I'm excited about coming up there in March. So yeah. oh, so uh, looking forward to that. Yeah. Hope, hopefully the snow will be gone. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. The days yeah. will be nice to be longer anyway. <laughs> so, 
All right. Well, both you guys, thank you for, for coming in this morning. And uh, for all the listeners, again, please join us, Healing Voices Project. Dot com. We're glad you joined us. Thanks again, and see you next week with Keith Nodick. Um, he's a uh, retired police officer featured in the movie One Cop's Journey, produced by none other than JC Films. Uh, so we'll see everybody soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye.